In the name of Jesus, I speak to you today. Amen. Good to be back with you. We had a good time in Kansas City this past weekend uh, watching our niece get married, and so it was a nice week, but of course it was a nice weekend last weekend. It's nice to be back with you. Well, many of you know that I was born and raised in the great state of Indiana, the Hoosier State. Sometimes I get people to ask me, now what exactly is a Hoosier, and what's that word mean? Well, oddly enough, no one really knows for sure. The best evidence com- that it comes from the term comes from the southern United States down south, and they use it as an insult to somebody who's a country bumpkin, a rustic person, right? Actually, this use of the word is exactly how people from St. Louis use it. I didn't even realize until we moved to St. Louis that anybody outside of Indiana even used the word Hoosier. But when we got to St. Louis, yeah, people would use it in this derogatory way. They'd say, yeah, those people up in Hannibal or across the river, they're just real Hoosiers because they were roughnecks or hicks, they thought, I guess. I don't know. I said, hey now, nothing's wrong with being a Hoosier. You just got to understand the proper use of the word, right? Well, now, of course, Purdue fans who were born in the state of Indiana, they say this. Hoosier by birth, Boilermaker by the grace of God, right? But Hoosier by birth, it kind of made me think, born of Indiana? That's kind of a weird thing to say, right? Still, there are many guesses on what the origin of the word Hoosier means. Some have even gone so far as to suggest that because Indiana people, Hoosiers, are so inquisitive that when they get to know you, they ask, well, well, who's your dad and who's your mama? And the Hoosier part stuck. I don't know about that. Something about this born of Indiana Hoosier by birth still confuses me a little bit. I'm not sure about that. But what I do know is this, and would you please read this verse with me here on the screen. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Born of. Born of. Now, we don't really use that phrase much, do we, or if at all. We don't say like, well, Johnny was born of his parents, Bob and Catherine. We, don't, we just don't say that. But for, for today, for use today, I'll use that. I was born of Joan and Ed. Isn't that a nice picture there? Yep, 1965, December of. Yeah, that means you know how old I am now. That's Joan and, Joan and Ed. God used Joan and Ed Wheeler to bring me into the world and to raise me as his child. I am born of Joan and Ed, not because of anything that I believe. Let's go back to that slide. Let's stay back on that one. There we go. Let's leave on that one. I am born of them, not because of anything I believe or confess, like the Bible verse said before. I am born of Joan and Ed simply through genetics. And believe me, I thank the Lord that I was born of them. No question about it. I am born of them. Now we can go to the next slide. Here's a next verse to contemplate, to read real quick to yourself. Now, I'm not the only one born of Joan and Ed Wheeler. My two older brothers, Keith and Brad, they are born of Joan and Ed as well. And my mom and dad, because they know God's word, they required us to love them and to love each other. And that seems like weird. We don't think of requiring someone to love another person. But that's what God's word says. And mom and dad are students of the Bible, hardly miss a Bible class. A lot of their friends go out to brunch, or a few of their friends go out to brunch after worship, and it makes them sad. They're like, wait a minute, we still got God's word to to study together with our brothers and sisters. So they are students of the Bible, and they know that God says that we are to love one another, to love them, our parents and our brothers and sisters. So that's what we were as a family. If we wouldn't love them or each other, it would be saying as if we are not born of Ed and Joan and that we really weren't a family if we wouldn't love one another. God wants a family to love each other like this, but he doesn't want that love just for biological families, does he? God wants that for his spiritual family as well. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father, now look at this part, loves whoever has been born of God. You see that? The Apostle John wrote this, and he wrote it the first century, about 90 AD. He wrote it to the congregation. The congregation needed a lot of help, so he wrote a lot about love, John did. And they needed to hear about the love of God and loving each other. You see, there were some people in the congregation who were teaching bad stuff. 
Some were even denying that Jesus is God. And so John's writing them a letter saying, look, don't do that. He was taking on a, um, the role of a father figure, John was, and saying, my children, don't listen to the bad theology. Uh -uh, that's not from God. That's from the devil. Look to the doctrine that you've been given from the apostles that say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He wanted them to learn that, but also to treat each other like the family of God. So, we who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the one sent from the Father to be the Savior of the world, to save us from our sin, from our death, and the devil, we are born of God. That's our real origins. That means we are, have one Father, and that means we are one family. Would you please read this one with me too? By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Notice this, excuse me. Loving God, loving his other children, and keeping his commandments are all interconnected. It's a package deal. You know, sometimes once in a while I'll run into somebody who says, well, I just love God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, but I really have a problem with Christians. <laughs> And I understand that in our sinfulness, but the fact of the matter is you really can't love God and not love fellow Christians. It's, that's inconsistent. Or sometimes people will say, well, I really love God, but I don't obey all of his commandments. It didn't fit my life. It didn't fit my lifestyle. Too much for me to do. And that's inconsistent too. You can't really love God and not keep his commandments too. It's a package deal. It's meant to go all together. We are to love God. We are also to love God. His other children are brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me ask you this. When we're talking about love, think of our congregation peace. Is our love for one another visible? When people think of peace, people in the community think of our congregation peace, do you think they say, wow, look at how they love one another? Or... Do you think they look at us and go, well, they're kind of cold and indifferent to one another? I hope not. I don't know. I pray that that's not the case. Like I tell my confirmation students, I say, look, I get it. You're all in different sports and different clubs, different activities. You may not be best of friends, and that's okay. You may not have a lot, of, a lot in common outside this place, but you do have the one thing that's most in common. You are children of God the Father. You are the family of Jesus Christ. So whether you like it or not, you're brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to love each other and be kind to each other. At least in the hallways at school, acknowledge each other. You know, do one of these if you want to say hi or uh, whatever. I don't know. However they do in seventh and eighth grade, I don't know. I've, it's been a long time since I've been there. So just remember that you are brothers and sisters in Christ, even if you're not BFFs, right? In the first three centuries, the Roman pagans would look down their nose at Christians they would often be persecuted. The Christians would be persecuted even unto death. But you know what those Roman pagans said of those Christians that they persecuted? They admitted that this, look how those Christians love one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as you know, we live in a society that's becoming harsher and harsher to Christians in our society. I hope that it's, there's relief. I hope that it gets better. But as I read the book of Revelation, it might do some of this stuff, you know, better than worse, peace, but then persecution, then peace, then persecution. But as I read Revelation, sooner or later, it's going to get really, 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 really bad. When it does, I pray that at least the pagans, those who don't trust in Jesus for salvation, at least they'll look at us and say, look how they love one another. Now, don't get me wrong. There were plenty of times in my young life and maybe in my older life when I didn't show love for my parents or for my three brothers. Being the youngest of three boys, and I was four years younger than the middle one, so they were two years apart, and then I came four years later. I was pretty much my brother's punching bag. Noogies were an almost everyday occurrence. And then I don't know about you, if you grew up in a family like this, if you did, you had a lot of brothers, or maybe sisters too, who were just rough and tumble. <laughs> I'll remember this till the day I die. I remember getting pinned, you know, wrestling matches, pinned on my back. You know how somebody, they'll put their one leg over here, they'll straddle, you put the other leg over here so you're helpless. Anybody? Nobody else? Just me? Okay. 
I know, I grew up as an abused, poor child, right? I do respect this. I, I like the fact that my mom and dad knew that boys, and girls too, need to have rough and tumble. That's a good thing, but they say, outside, outside, no rough housing. Outside. But anyway, so they allowed the roughhousing to go on, sometimes not to my happiness. But anyway, since I was the youngest, I'd be like here, and they'd be doing one of these, you know? You ever, when they start like tapping on your chest? Me, not me, not you, just me? Or the worst was, and I didn't share this in the early service, I don't know, maybe it's too gross, but this was the worst. Ready? Prepare yourself. Brace yourself. When they'd have me down, <laughs> and they'd let a little bit of spit come out, and then it's... A little bit of spit come out, and I'd be going, quit it, quit it, and I'd, and I'd be trying to kick, it, kick him with him, I'd hit him in the head. With him. Yeah, it was a tough life. You wonder why I don't want to go back to Indiana to live. And no, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Well, then, you know, I finally get to the point where I try to do what I could, but I'd yell, Mom, Mom, help me, Mom. And with all the kindness and compassion only a mother could say, I'd hear from the kitchen, fight back. I don't know if she was trying to make me tough or she was just tired of hearing me complain. So I don't, fight back! Happy Mother's Day. You're watching this. She'll be watching this on the internet. Love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Maybe you're probably at this point rolling your eyes going, okay, now I understand why Pastor is the way he is. He's had to be feisty to be a survivor. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. But when it got to be too much, when that all got to be way too much, we were reminded... They would step in, we would be reminded that we were a family and that families love one another and they sacrifice for one another. The same goes for the family of God. Jesus is our ultimate brother and our ultimate sacrifice. He went down into that water of his baptism. I think that's the next click there. He went down into that water of his baptism to begin the task of taking on our sin. Though he had no sin, at that very event, John the Baptist said, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. At his baptism, he starts his public ministry. He takes on the task of taking on the world's sin, past sin, present sin, future sin, for each of us, you too. Three years later, his blood would be spilt on the cross of Calvary. He would pay the penalty of death for all of our sins, your sins included. And then about 50 days after that, 50 so days after that, he would send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job is always to testify to Jesus and the work that he did for our salvation. On, in his life, in his death on the cross, and out of the grave, and in his ascension, and his coming again. The Holy Spirit, that's his job, to point us back to Jesus and his word. All of this so we could be the Father's children, so that we could be brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants, the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus because he wants us to know that this Jesus of Nazareth is the anointed one of God, the Son of God, the Messiah of God, the Christ of God. So, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God. Let's pray. Father, Thank you that we can call you Father. Through faith in Jesus, your Son, you are our Father, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you have brought us to faith in Jesus, so all glory goes to you. Help us to understand and remember that we are your family, and we each are interconnected as brothers and sisters. Help us to show you love and to love you every day of our lives, and help us to love one another. Teach us. To love. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.